It seems whether in his Beatles family or his actual family, George Harrison was always going to be seen as the baby. Born on the 25th of February 1943 at the family home at 12 Arnold Grove, Liverpool, George was the youngest of four children. His sister Louise was the oldest by 12 years, while his brothers Harold and Peter were nine years older and three years older. His father, also called Harold, was a bus conductor, while his mother, also called Louise, had worked as a shop assistant. As he was the youngest, George was used to being the centre of attention and being doted upon by everyone, particularly his sister. But as he got older, George became more independent and thoughtful. Being such a large family meant that the Harrisons would often struggle with money, but Harold always made sure his family were kept afloat, and when George was six, they finally moved out of cramped and small 12 Arnold Grove, with its single coal fire and outdoor toilet, into a council house in Spick, 25 Upton Green. Like his future bandmate Paul McCartney, George was baptised as a Catholic, just like his mother, but he could only attend Anglican primary schools. So when he was five, he was enrolled into Dovedale Primary, the same primary school that John Lennon was in at the time, though the two didn't know it at the time, since John was three years older than him, and you never really mingled with students who were younger than you. Soon it was time for him to take his 11 plus exam, and when he passed, he was accepted into the Liverpool Institute. However, much like John, George found education to be boring. In fact, he openly hated the lessons he was taught, and he started to rebel. Not to the extent that John would, but by simply not doing his homework and was frequently caned by the masters. Eventually, George became a teddy boy and started coming to the Institute wearing not the traditional grey, but in more flamboyant colours and clothes he'd borrowed from his brothers, and his hair was quipped so far up, he couldn't even wear the school cap anymore. Despite his failing grades, Harold and Louise were sympathetic towards their youngest son's new passion, which was music. Harold had originally been a ship steward for ocean liners, and so had already brought home several records from America before his children were born. Some of George's earliest influences and idols included George Formby and Jimmy Rogers, and during the 50s it was Carl Perkins and Lonnie Donegan. But of course it was Elvis Presley with Heartbreak Hotel that opened George's eyes about what he wanted to do, and that was to play rock and roll. He became obsessed with guitars, and when he was 13, he borrowed £3.10, which in today's money is like £100, from his mother, and bought a Dutch Eggman acoustic, and he soon dedicated all of his time to playing it. He even tried to start his own skiffle group called The Rebels with his brother Peter and a friend called Arthur Kelly. To pay back his mother for the guitar, George took a Saturday job with the local butcher shop and would deliver the weekend meat to the customers. Unlike John and Paul, George wasn't a naturally gifted musician. He would practice the guitar to some of the American solos he could until his fingers bled. One person who could see his determination and admiration was Paul McCartney, the two would often sit next to each other on the bus to school, and it wasn't long before the pair became good friends. By this point, Paul was a member of John Lennon's group The Quarrymen, and George would often tag along to watch their performances, until Paul suggested George be a member, despite the fact that at the time he was only 14. John, of course, wasn't interested. He always saw George as just a tag-along kid. But one of George's tricks was that he could play raunchy, an instrumental guitar piece, perfectly. And so in 1958, John decided to make George a member of the Quarrymen. One of the benefits of having George in the group was that the Quarrymen had a rehearsal space where they were actually welcome and tolerated. Louise, who had always loved music and singing, was more than happy to allow the boys to play their guitars in the house. Out of all the members of the Quarrymen, George was probably the one John's Aunt Mimi despised the most because, in traditional British thinking, he was working class and automatically trouble and a bad influence on her nephew. 
Since he hadn't passed his examinations, George decided to take up an apprenticeship as an electrician. But when the Beatles were asked to go to Hamburg, he had asked his brother what he should do. Should he continue his apprenticeship or go to Hamburg? Peter gave him his honest thoughts and said that he personally would go to Hamburg, and George took his advice. As the years went by and the Beatles began to gain more popularity, George was admittedly cool to the experience. Even though he played lead guitar, he always felt like he was looked down upon by those who came within their circle. During interviews, he appeared to be scowling and rarely smiled, which did make him look intimidating with his sunken cheekbones, contrasting to John, and especially Paul, who were always smiling and joking around. His title as the Quiet Beetle irked him because he only got the nickname in America when he couldn't talk much due to having laryngitis, and he always felt like he had a lot to say. It was just that John and Paul would always get most of the attention, which you can understand why they were the main songwriters. But even when George began developing as a songwriter himself, it felt like he wasn't taken seriously. He had to fight hard to get his songs onto an album. He had always been restricted to two a record, with the exception of Revolver, where he managed to get three of his songs on there. But when he did, the attitude seemed to be, it's a George song, let's just get it out of the way. George Martin admits he was responsible for this type of attitude, and he had said it was one of his biggest regrets when working with the Beatles. Fans as well annoyed George. Being quite shy, the constant media attention and the screaming fans all added to his growing hatred for Beatlemania. In an interview, he had mentioned that he had liked a bag of jelly babies, and so fans would often bombard the stage with the small confectionaries. It was even worse in America, which, not having jelly babies over there, substituted that for jelly beans, which are much harder and can hurt a bit more. George was the first Beatle to voice opinion on not wanting to tour anymore. Being a perfectionist, he just couldn't see what was to be gained from improving as musicians if they had to play the same songs over and over again, and no one could hear what they were playing anyway. After the concert at Candlestick Park in 1966, their last live show, George had announced that he was no longer a Beatle. Even though the band would carry on after this, it was becoming clear that George's interests and tastes were drifting away to something new and different, and something that wouldn't need his fellow Beatles. 